I'm the fallen angel Christopher Daniels, an inspiration to children everywhere, a national treasure. You're watching Dre Gaiman 41. Dre 41 Gaiman, my man.
uh, him, um, him and my mother weren't no longer together, but I still considered him my stepfather. Um, yeah. I woke up and I felt sick, like sick to my stomach. And I'm like, I don't know what's wrong. Like, I, I would say, always say I had an iron stomach. Like, nothing would make me sick. Like, I only threw up twice in my life. That's it. And this is when I was like a little kid. After that, nothing could make me throw up. I could see something nasty. I'm fine. But this day, I was just like, oh, my goodness. Like, something's wrong. I don't know what's wrong, but something is wrong. I don't know what it is. I worked the whole day. Mind you, I'm at work at Dunkin' Donuts in the food, you know, retail, food retail. And I feel like I got to throw up the whole time. So I'm just holding it in. Like, I don't know what's wrong. Something is wrong. I got to get out of work. Did the full shift. And right when I got out of work, that's when I find out, found out he died in his sleep. And I was so devastated. It was just like, I'm, I'm a kid. And I'm like, I have to put on a strong face and still go to work and, and, and just find a way to just keep on going. Because I wanted to move out my mother's place. I wanted to, you know, have my own spot. Like, I'm getting older. I'm, you know, turning into a man. So I'm, yeah. I'm ready to go. So, But it, I understand. I completely understand. It was like times where I had to walk away from the register and just go in the bathroom and just like, let it out because it was just like i don't know how to handle this like this is new yeah. to me you know it's different if it's like i had a grandfather who died and it's like he lived a full life so it was like you know worst case scenario looking at it or best case scenario he lived a full life you know and and you're not gonna live forever but when it just happened so immediately to somebody who was you know in their 50s it's like oh wow like i'm not yeah. ready for that you know and so I, I completely yeah. understand how you feel with, like about that, and it's like having to take time. I, I completely understand that. So like you said, right? I mean, your stepfather, he wasn't, you know, it was an unexpected happen as well. Like he, he wasn't sick or nothing. As far as you knew, nothing. He yeah. was at work every single day. Even like he had a yeah. broken leg, he would still go to work all the time. Never, never would call out. Never. Like one of the most hardest working people I've I've ever known. I mean, did so much for me. I mean, got me a goat cart multiple bikes i mean got me my first playstation you know like everything i mean yeah. was, was definitely dead. yeah was dead. yeah man that's and it's and like you said, said it's the unexpectedness of it that just it just adds even more to the pain and the grief that you're going through because for me and i'm sure for you i'm sure you can relate like there was so much shock involved too yeah so i'm like no and you like, don't I believe it. i know like, you, you can't like, believe yeah it. yeah yeah, oh, brother, I'm really sorry to hear that, man. But yeah, I, so yeah, we, we, we understand each other. Yeah, it is. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's, that's the level of pain where, I mean, I, I don't like to think that I have any enemies, but like, if I did, like, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst yeah. enemy. Because it, 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 you know? I mean, it, like, it just, it burns a hole in you where it's like you can't operate normally. Like, you, you can't eat. You lost, like, you lost your hunger. Like, you, you're not hungry. You can't sleep. And it's like you want to. You want to be able to do it, but you just can't because it's just that, that loss. It's like a piece of you that, that went away too. So, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely, like, understand that. And I tell people that all the time. It's like, when people have both their parents, I say, listen, man, y'all don't know how, like, lucky you are. Like, one of mine yeah. was taken away when I was a kid, you know? And, I mean, I have pictures of him when I was, like, three years old. Like, he was literally there, like, from, I mean, when I was a baby, basically. You know, he stepped yeah. in, took care of me and my sister. So, no, I, I definitely understand how you feel. And it's, like, it's even something that I think about to this day. Like, so, no, I definitely understand. Yeah. Yeah. But um, let's let's um turn the page a little bit. Um, so now you're you're working for Ukes, and yeah, and and you're also working with Two K. Um, how did you you know like how did you feel about it? Like, did you feel like you were a pigeon held more? You know, working in cahoots with them, were there certain things that you wanted to do that they said no, that's not our plans or or anything like that? Uh, are you talking about, like, as far as, like, me working with the youths now and then also working with 2K? Well, yeah, once, once, once you, yeah. you know, once THQ once made folded switch. and now you're, you're with youths, but, you know, working with 2K, how, I mean, like, after a little bit of time went past, did you find yourself pigeon-held or, or feeling like you wasn't able to be as creative as you could be with the game? Uh, so here's the thing. Like, this is a question that I, not... I see debated a, a lot, like on on like Twitter and you know other like social forums and everything. That like this whole like how the whole di dynamic of the relationship, mm -hmm. and I'll break it down. Okay. 
So the way that, and, it, and it, I'm, I'm going to lump, I mean, so I'm so, do my best to explain this best as I probably as I can. Mm-hmm. So THQ, when they were around, and 2K now, being the publisher, they have, they are the ones who hold the rights to the WWE uh, license. Mm-hmm. So it's theirs. Ukes is the contracted developer that is hired by the publisher with THQ 2K to then build and develop the game based off of the license that the publisher is holding. Okay. So to that end, uh, the license holder, whether it was THQ back in the day, 2K now, they are, they have, in this, at least in this relationship, they have the, uh, they have the, the authority on, on both sides. They have, you know, the creative league and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ukes are, we are the contractors. We are the ones that are given instruction and then we build. <laughs> uh, now, now, with that being said, you know, when I was, when we were still doing the, the WWE game, you know, us being Ukes, mm-hmm. of course, you know, and even when I was at THQ, you know, collaborating with Ukes, of course, it's a partnership where, you know, both sides, you know, present their creative visions, their ideas, you know, Ukes submits their ideas, um, and everybody kind of takes everybody's ideas, and it's the publisher uh, that, 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 that has, you know, final control, is the yay or nay decision maker on, on what's implemented and what's not. Um, and that's how, that's been the case, you know, back when THQ was the publisher, and it's the case, uh, or was the case when we were working with 2K uh, as the publisher. So sometimes they will take an idea from Ukes, they being, you know, whoever the publisher was. Uh, a lot of times they wouldn't um, because it's the publisher that, that wants to drive the creative. So, mm-hmm. yes, working at working with Ukes and submitting ideas, you know, gameplay ideas, modes, anything. Um, at first it was frustrating because it was difficult for me being on the development side mm-hmm. and no longer having the uh, more of the control and sway that the publishing side had. So there were a lot of times where, yeah, you know, whether it was myself or, you know, other members of the Yuke Sting would submit stuff and, you know, and it, it wouldn't get, you know, implemented or they would pass on it. But, you know, it, it, it took me a while to get used to that. But once that dynamic was, you know, I got used to it, it was like, look, you know, I was kind of, you know, relying to the fact that it was like, look, uh, I enjoy what I do. Mm-hmm. I enjoy, you know, writing game designs and I know that I'm a creative individual, so... I just leaned into that, and it was like, if it, if it gets in, it gets in. If not, that's cool, too, because at the end of the day, like, I know that this is dope, and, yeah. and if they don't see it, then, you know, they make those decisions, and, you know, hopefully it was one that was good for them, but uh, but that, that, that style of relationship uh, operates. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, even when I was at, at THQ, and, you know, you know, we, you know, having to, you know, presenting ideas to whether it was Corey or, you know, the top decision makers, you know, a lot of times, you know, some, some things got through, some things didn't. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, but that, that in a nutshell is how that relationship works. Okay. Um, so, I, and I, I wouldn't even say it's a case of like anybody being held back. Yeah. It's just, it's just that as a developer, you know, the situation, the situation was just different where we were the contracted developer and they had the final say and, you know, obviously, when it comes to things of a creative nature, things are subjective. Yeah. You know, uh, but I will say that, you know, in anything that we do moving forward, uh, we, you know, being you, so I mean, like my boss, you know, Haromia said in her article that was released a couple of months back, you know, whatever new thing we get into, you know, we are going to be the decision makers as far as uh, the, cre- the creative side goes. Mm-hmm. And this is something that, uh, that we are very, that we hold strongly to. And, uh, and it's something that our potential partners um, also see as a value. So I'm excited just in that point where it's like now we can kind of get back to what it is we do without having to um, be uh, subservient. That kind of sounds too harsh, but, <laughs> but without, you know, 
But I mean, two is a conglomerate. You know what I'm saying? So I can understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but, but, but essentially, yeah, we because we can basically develop the game that we want to make, uh, and we'll have full kind of creative control. So mm-hmm. that's an exciting prospect uh, for us, and uh, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, all of us are. <laughs> But you know what? Just just to give you like a perspective from the outside looking in, like I remember playing the the wrestling games on the 360, and then 2K15 came out on Xbox One, and I bought I bought the game off the rip because I'm like, okay, new graphics. I'm pretty sure it's gonna have new this, new that, bunch of matches, everything. I was like, um, they got this for 360, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go get the 360 one, and <laughs> I was just, because I was just so. I mean, I was hit when I when I played 2K15 on Xbox One. I was just like, this game has nothing. This game, li- like, I couldn't create a wrestler in that game to save my life. I created one wrestler, and it was like an alternate attire for Bray Wyatt when he was like, um, when when he was his like his first gimmick when he was in NXT. And I was like, I'm done. I'm oh, going back here. to 360. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't play it. I could. That's the one wrestling game that I could not play was 2K15. On Xbox One, 2K15 or 360, cool, and and it like yeah. even to me, like with THQ, I felt like THQ, and, and this is from the outside looking in, I felt like THQ gave you guys more creative freedom because the games were so fun and it had so much. Like for an example, here comes the pain. Shut your mouth. They, these are widely regarded as some of the best wrestling games ever, and these games came out 10, 20 years ago. There's a reason why is because I feel like the, the you guys were given so much create like creative control to make this the best wrestling game. It could be zany. You'll fight in uh, Times Square, throw them off a helicopter. Who can make the game fun? It's like you guys yeah. were able to submit more stuff and, and it, okay, cool, no problem. And I feel like now with like I think 2K is more like simulation based and. They want a controlled environment to where it really replicates what you see on TV when it's like, we enjoy what we see on TV, but we don't want to buy a game and just be stuck with that. So I feel like THQ definitely gave you guys more creative freedom as opposed to 2K. And I mean, it, it kind of it kind of shows. I mean, if, if I can play Here Comes the Pain on PlayStation 2 for hours and then I'm playing... Uh, 2k for an hour maybe 45 minutes that shows so i i can definitely on my end without you having to say it i feel like i feel like thq gave you guys more freedom than uh than 2k well, well here's the thing here's the thing you are right like you mentioned you know shut your mouth uh here comes the pain one of the uh those early smackdown games and you're right uh that was you know yukes definitely had more, they have far more creative control over those games, and it shows. I mean, as you can see, yeah. um, and it was. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it was probably beginning with uh, that first SmackDown versus Raw, and then definitely leading into SmackDown versus Raw 2006. That um, the creative, uh, the create the creative reign started to be applied more so on the publishing side. Uh, and less so on the youth side. And I think that's when you start to see that split. Because there is a pretty big, uh, maybe not big split, but there's there's a difference between, it's almost like a line of demarcation between Here Comes the Pain mm-hmm. and then SmackDown versus Raw. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's, that's attributed to THQ, uh, the management, the, the decision makers, the creative decision makers, exerting more influence over the creative and minimizing uh you know, the creativity and influence of youth. Mm-hmm. And that has been, been the through line ever since. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm not even saying that's a good or a bad thing, because look, I mean, I, I worked on these games, you know, where these where the creativity was on us, us being THQ. So, you know, uh, but that is the thing, and it was one of the things where they wanted to, even at THQ, they wanted to try to lean in on more of the sim side um, and, you know, 2K now definitely does. Yeah. And, and look, you know, I, I, I hear both sides. I mean, there's, there are some people who, who really favor that simulation heavy aspect of the gameplay. Mm-hmm. And then of course there are those who don't. And, and I see both. I mean, I think the one thing that 
for those who don't are on fan of the sim heavy stuff, I think it's magnified if only because there's no other alternative, you know, product where it's like you can't like it be it might be one thing to have, you know, okay, this game is the sim. I can deal with that. I you know, I can like it for what it is because, you know, at the end of the day if I get if I want something a little more kind of old school or arcadey, mm-hmm. I can play this. So you kind of have that balance. And I think with there only being the one AAA wrestling title, you know, it's almost like if you, if you don't like that same heavy approach, you kind of, and you're a wrestling fan and you're a gamer, you kind of throw your hands up and it's like, damn, I just want to, I, I, I'm tired of dusting off my PS2 and, and 64 games just to play the type of wrestling game that I want. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, yeah, you know, that's, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's the state of things, but, I, I enjoy, I mean, I would say this about 2K15, mm-hmm. and I know that a lot of people weren't happy with uh, with that game, and I, from a, from a player side, a gamer side, I understand. Yeah. Um, it definitely was uh, likes of a lot of features that were in it mm-hmm. previously, but I mean, honestly, without getting too in the weeds and stuff, I mean, a lot of that was just attributed to the, the, the development schedule, I mean, that whole year, the transition of the team. And I'm not making this use, and I'm just kind of stating facts and yeah. stuff. And and then honestly, just you know, anytime you're making that migration onto a new uh, new console, it's uh, it's always going to be a process, and it certainly was a process for us. Um, I mean, personally, just personally speaking, like I I look at 2K15 and the, the Xbox One, PS4, whatever, yeah. and I'm very proud of it. Um, more so for personal reasons, mm-hmm. because I look at that game and like all the shit that I had to go through personally just to kind of help get that thing out the door. Yeah. So for me, it's a personal achievement. But obviously, yes, from the game side, as a player, as a consumer, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it was definitely light uh, on a lot of features. Um, but yeah, and uh, I guess it is. It was what it was. Yeah. Um, I mean. As, as wrestling fans, we're kind of stuck because we're going to get it because it's it's what's only available. And it's understandable. Like, I say every year, like, as much as I can complain about a game, the one game I know I'm going to get is a WWE game. I have to get a wrestling game. I have to. <laughs> like, I'm a wrestling fan through in and out. I watch everything, you know. So, it's my, you know, me being able to get the game is me being able to create these wrestlers to, to show them off to the world. And with the platform that I feel like I have, it's like like Wrecking Ball. Like he was uh he was on Ring of Honor. Um he did he did he you know he wrestled around like he got trained by Bully Ray. Um so I'm like okay, you know, I met him at a indie event at Northeast Wrestling and it was like it was so cool because at the end of the show he's standing at the door shaking people's hands as they leave. Which I thought was like so cool and that you know, it, it just showed like he was a real person. And I appreciated that. And it was just like, okay, well, you know, let me let me try to make a video, put you out there, make a call of you. Like, I did that with him, Vinny Marseglia, um, oh, nice. ACH. Like, even ACH, when he came out with the Tiger Mask attire, he sent yeah. me the pictures of it before he wore it. And he was like, don't make, don't make the call of me until after I have the match. So I have like these, like you know, little relationships with these wrestlers to where it's like, um, they respect the work, and I and I'm so yeah. appreciative that they like what they, like even Lindsay Dorado, he retweeted some of the stuff. Like I sent him logos so he can create an updated attire for himself on PlayStation. Like I man, I <laughs> I try to like just sow my 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 DNA within the call community. And just not only that, with wrestlers, like RVD followed me off of me creating a wrestler for him, or of him, not for him, because I don't think he plays the game. But um, just like even Matt Taven, uh, Vinny Marseglia, TK Orion, um, a lot of different wrestlers. Uh, Conan, um, Conan even shouted me out on his um, on his podcast, which I thought was really cool. Um, no way. Yeah, man. He hit me up, like he sent me a DM, like, um, yo, like, you know... Can I shout you out or whatever? I'm like, hell yeah. Like, <laughs> by, by all means, sir. I would appreciate that. <laughs> For oh, real. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, like, okay, so 
uh, what I wanted to do now is just talk about the current landscape of wrestling and, and you know, what you what you feeling, what you're not feeling. Now, I know with WWE, it's, I guess it's sort of PG still or not, but what are, what are your thoughts on AEW? Like, what they've been doing their last couple of shows and also the All Out? Uh, I, I mean, I love what AEW is doing. Um, I really do. Uh, I, I, you know, I, um, I mean, just first of all, I'm, I've always, I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good indicator of talent. You know, I really am. Not to, uh, again, toot my own horn, but toot, too. <laughs> I remember, just, it just had, like, like, everybody's going crazy about Buddy Murphy now. I remember I sent out a tweet in 2015. I remember I was in Japan. And I was doing research on him for his moveset. And uh, I watched about 10 of his matches, you know, uh, on the indies when he was Matt Silva. And I was like, dude, if, if he's, once he's able to show and get out of his tag team with uh, Wesley Blake, I'm thinking to myself, once he's able to show this side of himself, this dude is a talent. And I remember sitting down at a tweet talking about, hey, keep, 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 your, keep your eye out for Buddy Murphy. He's going to be something special. <laughs> took a while, but people are finally starting to see it. Um, but I say that because yeah, I remember when Cody Rhodes debuted in WWE. And I remember everybody thinking at the time that it was Ted DiBiase Jr. that was going to be the breakout star of the two of them. I'm going to be honest. I thought and, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people did. A lot of people did. I didn't. I saw, I, don't, I, I just saw something special in Cody Rhodes at the time. And especially him coming in, you know, Teaming with uh, Harcourt Holly, he just had—I don't know—he just had a way about him. And it's not—I mean, he's a—he's a good wrestler. He's not going to wow you so much with his deep move set, mm-hmm. um, but he's got all these other intangibles. Like I thought, his facial expressions were always really good. Um, his timing was really good. He just had a certain knack for things, and I was, uh, yeah, always a fan of him. And in WWE, like no matter what kind of silly gimmick they gave him. Mm-hmm. Whether it was the uh, the dashing Cody Rhodes, and then when he's putting the garbage, uh, the, the the brown paper bags on people, that was wonderful. Heads in the front row, I loved that. <laughs> so did I. Like in lesser hands, this thing would not have gotten over to the degree that it did. But any any time he was given one of these gimmicks, he just struck it out of the ballpark. And even the Stardust thing, and he didn't like it, but he leaned into it, mm-hmm. and he made that something special. Um, so when he left WWE in 2015, you know after. You know, his father passed. I, first of all, I understood where he was coming from because I could tell he was unhappy with where he was. And he was just like, you know what? Life is too short. I, I gotta, I gotta do me now. And I can do better than what I'm currently doing. So I've been a supporter of him in a huge way from the beginning. And when he left and started doing his indie stuff, like I was, you know, trying to order every kind of show that I could to see him on the Indies. I saw him in PWG when he did a, a stop there. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, like I've always, I've, I've loved the Young Bucks since day one, the first time I saw him in PWG. And I, <laughs> I remember the first time I saw him. This, this was like, PWG was so great in terms of instilling in me not to judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Because I remember the first time that I saw Pac, but most, and I was like, this guy, well, who was this tasty dude <laughs> running around with the name Pac? I was like offended at a Tupac fan. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, you what? know? I, I'm gonna say the same thing. I felt this. I'm like, why? What, who would see to say his name is Pac? Like, what is it? Like, what is he trying to do here? Yeah, yeah. Um, but all it took was to see him wrestle, and I'm like, all right, Brian, shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and the same thing with the young bucks. Because I remember the first time I saw them. First of all, this was back when, I don't even know if you remember this, but in PWG, they used to come out to, to uh, Mbop. You remember oh, that song? Oh, okay, so, okay, so I'm, I'm about to be 33 this year, so I'm not that far off from you. Um, okay. I remember getting the, what was the, the DVDs I used to buy? Oh, man, this is bad. I used to have DVDs. Um, oh, my goodness, it was like RF video or... All right, yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was something else. Um, ringside pl- something, but I, yeah, I, I remembered. I was like, that is like the Hansons. Like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, just heat generated. I, I'm like, what the? And then they come out, and they're on the small side, mm-hmm. not overly muscular, and they got tassels. And I'm lo- I'm looking at them, and I'm like, what the fuck am I watching right now? <laughs> like, like who, these guys are wrestlers. Yeah. But, but just like Pac, 
And I, I don't even know who they were wrestling at that, the first time I saw them. But with all of within four minutes, I was like, okay, that's it, Brian. Never again. I'm never judging any of these guys until I see them in the ring. Because I became a fan immediately. Like, these guys are doing shit that was just out of this world. And I, my, like, my jaw was on the ground the entire time. Mm. Um, so, I love, I love all what, you know, the fact that these guys got together, Cody and the Bucks and Omega, I think just for being a fan, mm-hmm. I think, you know, again, you're talking about options, you know, it gives, it gives fans another option. It, you know, highlights pro wrestling in a way that, you know, uh, it really hasn't been in a long time, at least on the mainstream side with them having their TNT deal. Um, so I'm really stoked about it. I, I ordered double and nothing and, um, had a house full of people, most of them who hadn't watched wrestling in forever, and they were all just like blown away mm. uh, by that show. Um, like a lot of people, I wasn't a big fan of their early pre shows. Like that kind of worried me. If I'm being honest, I mean that pre show really? had double and nothing. I was, yeah, huh. it kind of it. I don't know. The the tone seemed off because they kept talking about how they wanted to do this more sports like presentation and this, that, and the other, and that pre-show was a little too kind of, uh, it felt, especially the pre-show was double or nothing, that battle royal they had, it was a little too gimmicky, and it oh, felt a little yeah. too yeah. WWE comedy for me, and okay. I was like, no guys, this is not what I want, I thought you guys were going to be the opposite of this, <laughs> uh, but thankfully, once the actual pay-per-view started, it was exactly what I expected and what I want from them, mm-hmm. so I am so looking forward to October 2nd, and actually, I'm actually going to, I'm going to All Out, uh, with some buddies of mine, so so that's gonna be fun. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of AEW. Uh, I like, I got they've got a really good roster going. Um, yeah, I mean, and and now we got a Wednesday night war, which to me really isn't much of a war, just personally because as, as soon as I heard that, because I love NXT as much as I will criticize like the main, yeah. the WWE main roster shows. Uh, and honestly, look, I don't do it. You know, just because. I mean, I really do think that they need to tighten up their, their booking and their creative on those on those shows. Mm-hmm. But NXT is amazing, man. Oh, like, I love cool. NXT. Yeah. Um, and honestly, like, NXT to me, like, if, if AEW can present a product that is similar to NXT, even a little bit, I think that's a win. I mean, as long as... I would much rather AEW be more akin to that show than anything that we see on Raw and SmackDown. Mm-hmm. Um, so when they made the announcement that, you know, NXT was going to USA, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, look, I mean, if they're going to force me to choose, I'm going to watch AEW because they're new. Yeah. Uh, I like, I like their, the talent. Not that I don't like the talent in NXT, but I just figured that I, I could always be able to watch it on the WWE Network anyway. So mm-hmm. once they said that, yes, it'll be on, you know, the day after that Thursday. NXT, I'm like, oh, that's perfect because that's when I watch NXT anyway. I never watch (laughs) NXT on Wednesdays now. I always always watch it Thursday morning when I come into the office. So for me, it doesn't doesn't change anything for my Wednesday. Uh, So I'll check out AEW and I'll check out NXT the day, you know, the next day. So uh, I'm really excited for this, man. This is is really fun. And and I hope that both of these shows do well in the ratings. I think they will. Um, But I mean... for, For a lot of stuff that I've read, because I read The Observer and stuff. Yeah. Um, like, Dave Milter has been reporting that there really isn't that much crossover between, with these two audiences either. I think there's an expectation that, you know, AEW is going to pull all these WWE fans to them. But from everything that I've read that Milter's reported is that that crossover is not as great as I think a lot of people expected it to be. Hmm. Uh, which I which I find interesting, you know. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So again, it'll be. So I think I think both shows will do well for themselves in the ratings, and I think that's great for the talent. I think especially the wrestlers. Mm-hmm. You know, having friends that wrestle uh, in WWE now and elsewhere, um, I think it's good for them. It'll increase their value. It'll give them more leverage when it comes time to negotiate. Um, and I'm always on the boys' side. And that's the thing too, like when it comes to promotions, like I don't, I'm not, I don't wave a flag for any promotion. Like I wave, I'm, I'm on the side of talent and it's on, it, I'm in, it's the same way that I feel about teams. 
yeah. like professional teams. Like I'm a Laker fan, but when it comes to like a management versus player yeah. type thing, I'm usually always going to take the side of the player versus management. Uh, or the ownership group. And that's kind of how I feel about promotions, where it's like, yes, you know, treat your guys right, but I'm always going to be on the side of the wrestlers. Um, yeah. So this is good for them. So, yeah, this I can't wait, brother. Yeah, me neither. And it's like, I want them to, to come to Connecticut, honestly. They need to run a show right here in downtown Hartford. Like, that's what they need to do, and show WWE that they can sit there and put on a better product, because it's only going to make everybody better. If they go to war, exactly. quote-unquote, war with each other... It's only going to make both, both, you know, both companies put out all the stops, and the people who who benefit from it is us. So I mean, by all yep. means, yeah, go by, go to war, please, <laughs> please do. Yeah, we we need to see yeah, it because I, I, it's getting stale. It's it, getting stale. Yeah. And, yeah, you're right. And this is going to be good for everybody. It's going to be good for the rest. It's going to be good for the, the fans. And and maybe you know as much as even probably Mister Man wouldn't. Admit this, it's going to be good for WWE. Absolutely. Like you said, I mean, even, like, you can, I can see AEW's influence on the product already, just in terms of, like, for all the past couple of weeks has been, I guess, has been a little bit better than it's been in the past, Mm -hmm. you know, the recent past. And I think, and I think a large part of that is due to the fact that it's like, hey, we got competition now. We really got to, you know, uh, dot the I's, cross our T's, and really kind of button some of this stuff up. So, you know, Raw, is, I've seen improvements with Raw. SmackDown, is, strangely enough, kind of got a little worse for me. Like, this whole Roman Reigns thing is kind of silly. It's, yeah, it's, I, I don't think they know like, what I, to do with it. I, uh, yeah, I the whole, like, I'm a big New Japan fan. Like, for me, and, I, and again, I'm you know, this is all subjective, but I like my pro wrestling uh, presented in a more sports-like fashion, mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons why I love New Japan's product. Um... For me, the one thing I really kind of don't like about the other is that, look, I know you, of course, you got to have storylines. Even hey, New Japan has storylines, yeah. but their storylines are all kept within this sports-like world. And it's more uh, simplistic. And it's more simplistic because when you start introducing elements like, you know, vehicular homicide <laughs> and stuff like that, I'm like, come on, like, how, like what? Why would, I mean, at this point, like, my head, it's like... How is this going to resolve itself in a ring? <laughs> You're trying to kill this man. It's <laughs> like, and then Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan are out, you know, kidnapping people and bringing them to to the shows and blindfolded or putting bags on the people's heads. And I'm like, okay, first of all, like, why, why is Daniel Bryan leading investigations into this? Like, where are the cops? Someone's trying to kill Roman Reigns at his place of employment. It's just, those kind of stories are just, they, that's just kind of, for me personally, a little too beyond the pale for what yeah. uh, how I like my wrestling you know it's <laughs> yeah. like you tried to murder me so let's go settle this in the ring it's like no fuck you man I'm <laughs> taking your ass to prison <laughs> yo for real but you know what you brought up a good point and you know let, let's go to that let's talk about New Japan like so okay here's here's my issue with New Japan and I'm gonna I'm gonna go to and I made a video on this already I feel like Kenta brought back new life in the Bullet Club that Switchblade couldn't. Do you agree or disagree with that? Uh, see, okay. <laughs> on, the, on the surface, yeah, you know what? I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, Jay White is a really, really good wrestler. Mm-hmm. A really, really good wrestler. A really, really good wrestler whose matches I typically do not want to watch, which is strange. I mean, I'll just, I'll just you know, like, I, I see the talent mm-hmm. is there. He's really good. Uh, that match that G was final between him and Ibushi was just incredible. I mean, and the one thing that, the fact that he's got so much, he, like, he is a heel through and through. Like, he, people hate that man, and he plays into that fantastically. Because, again, he's good at what he does. But there is something about him that, unless it's of a match of such magnitude, like a G1 final or something like that, he's someone who, as good as he is, I he, I, I typically, yeah, I don't really want to see him see his matches. <laughs> so, so yeah, and this angle that they just ran with Kenta, and I love Kenta. Like, uh, 
he's my dude. Like, he's my favorite Japanese wrestler probably ever. And, you know, him and his whole time in WWE was unfortunate, the injuries and all that. It was terrible. I just, I feel, I felt bad for him. Yeah. But yeah, he's got a new lease on life in New Japan. And that angle they ran between him and Shibata, him turning on him and joining Bullet Club. Yeah. It's given, it's given Bullet Club a whole, a fresh new lease on life, an injection of some, uh, a much needed injection of, injection of some, uh, some energy. Because yeah. it kind of felt, I mean, Bullet Club was just starting to flounder a bit, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So, no, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. So, so, okay, so what about, like, how, how do you, like, okay, so you stayed in Japan. Uh, fans take wrestling, I know, more seriously, or take it as more, like, you know, like a sports, a uh, sport in Japan. But was it, like, different for you to be, like, in the crowd, and it's, like, how fans react to wrestling as opposed to, like, in the States? Like, was it, like, strange to you? Like, man, they're, like, way quiet here. Like, what is this? Um, initially, yeah. Like, back when I, when I went to my first show, that, that uh, Pro Wrestling Noah show that I mentioned in 2006, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was strange. Because at first, you know, and, and, I, and they, like, in 2006, I'd only been to Japan. That might have been my second or third time. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we are in 2019, and I've gone through two passport books in that time. I've been to Japan so, so many times. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, Japan's like my second home. So early on, it was strange, but I get it, or I got it. You know, Japan, just culturally, they're different uh, in terms of, like, when you're in an audience, especially with, with wrestling. It's not that they don't, or they won't get excited, but, you know, they just, uh, they pop for, for different things, you know, uh, and they just want to, and, and more than anything else, like, them being quiet is them being kind of just more respectful to what's going on in the ring. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh... I was in Japan in July for two weeks. Uh, so I sent that tweet that got me in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, I was in Japan and like, I was there for two weeks and in that time I went to three G1 shows. Um, and and I, and I can't say, you know, the crowds have definitely gotten more uh, Americanized yeah. than, you know, compared to, you know, back in 2006. They're still not as, I guess, like, not not as loud or as vocal as, you know, American crowd, mm -hmm. but definitely far more than they have been. And I think a lot of that is attributed to, of course, the G1 being what it is, and just, you know, New Japan is being a, uh, a hot product right now, uh, in Japan especially, you know, obviously. Um, so it's different, but still, it's still vocal. And the guys that I go with, you know, my coworkers and my friends at Ukes, yeah, they are, they 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 are very much uh, of the uh, they they like to chant a yeah. lot. That's what, like they they love that about American wrestling. So they'll often try to start chants uh, in the crowd. And sometimes if you're watching the New Japan World, like anytime, you know, uh, it it, it kind of does quiet down. If you, I'm sure if if a chant kicks off, it's more than likely my homeboy uh, Kugetron uh, trying to get something started. <laughs> Because he's very vocal, he's very loud. Um, but uh, no, I, I love watching uh, wrestling in Japan. And the best thing about it, though, mm -hmm. <laughs> honestly, mm -hmm. is uh, is that the concessions, the yeah. food, the beers, are the same prices as they are outside of the arena. Maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. but, it, but you're not going to be paying 20 bucks for a beer, $16 for a beer. Wow. Um, and, on, and on top of that, they allow you to bring in outside food and drink. So every time we go like, <laughs> we go to see wrestling, the first thing we do, we hit the convenience store. Uh -huh. I'll get, you know, uh -huh. some beers, some snacks, and, you know, spend about 10 bucks at the convenience store and then take that into the arena and just, you know, have ourselves a little, a little wrestling party, <laughs> you know? So uh, that that's really cool. Um, but, okay, so what do you think New Japan has to do to really build their brand in America. I mean, because we, we saw what happened in Texas where it wasn't really, like, full. Like, the arena wasn't really full. So, I mean, like, what, in your opinion, what do you think New Japan has to do to, like, really become a global, a global wrestling uh, promotion? Yeah. Uh, man, that is a really good question. I, I wondered that myself. <laughs> um, because, 
because your product is so good. And when I saw that, you know, that, that event they had in, in uh, was it Dallas? Dallas, yeah. yeah. For, that, for G1, it was, it was sad seeing all those empty seats. But at the same time, the fans that were there were so into that product. Um, I was, I, I did a podcast before and you know, this topic came up and, yeah, I think, I th- okay, a, a couple of things. I think they need to be very surgical mm-hmm. in where they choose to run shows. Yes. Um, when they announced that show in Dallas and at that arena, I thought to myself, New Japan and Dallas, like, I just don't know if that was the right um, uh, city for them. And there's no disrespect to, you know, I'm, of course, I'm sure they got fans uh, in Texas and Dallas, of course, I mean, obviously they do. Yeah, but and but and then, and then to run a an arena of that size, I think they probably would have been more well off to have done it in a smaller space. But I I remember reading something that I think it was Access Television that uh, wanted them to run there uh, for the television, so that could have had something to do with it. You know, Mark Cuban owns Access, and yeah, it was in his it was in his arena, so that could have had something to do with it. Possibly, mm-hmm. I don't know, but. Yeah, I think they got to be more, more surgical with where they choose to run shows. I know they do very well here in, uh, in L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, they're, they're, they're having an event in Long Beach um, tomorrow, uh, the Super Jacob Tournament. is yeah. going on right now. Um, beyond that, I think they also need to do a better job of, like, when they do announce shows, like, they need to do better about announcing, you know, matches... Like, get out of the gate hot. You know, it's not enough to say, we're going to be here. You've got to say, we're going to be here, and this this is our main event, or this is one of our our top matches. Like, they they were very slow to announce a lineup for Dallas, which I think might have hurt it, because, you know, at the end of the day, the main event was, you know, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Okada. That's a huge freaking match, especially yeah. here, you know, uh, in America. But we see You know, if they might have... What's that? But we've seen that match before. We've seen it, but but it's one thing to but but in America to, to be able to see them go at it live. Yeah. Because I mean, it, you know, like I've seen them wrestle a whole bunch of times in, in Japan, but you know, a lot of folks don't have that luxury or ability to. And when you can, you know, promote a match between these two guys, and and you know, I mean, look for me, I get it. Yeah, I've seen them wrestle so many times. I'm like, yes, I know this will be good, but. But just for, yeah, for other fans, it's like, yeah, you know, if I can get a ticket and go see them live, I mean, that's something that as a wrestling fan, I gotta jump on that. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, they gotta do a better job of, like, letting people know uh, at least some of the matches for their shows. And also, they gotta freaking advertise this shit, man. Yeah. That, yeah <laughs> like, that, obviously, that is the biggest thing. Yeah, that's true. Because I, I remember, I'm like, um, I don't even know what matches are happening. Like, what? Like, I, I okay, yeah, the main event, like you were saying, but even on my end, I'm like, I don't think I should even buy the pay-per-view. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, I seen that match happen. I know they had a great match, but it's like, how many times you want to see Stone Cold and The Rock go at it? It's like, eh, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. Like, I, I've seen that. So I, I think it is yeah. that. And I think they need to stick to coastlines first and work their way in. Yes. That, that yes, like, they, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly about that. Um, and, uh... Yeah, they got it. They got it. Because I, I, I look at New Japan, and then you, you know, look at what AEW has done mm-hmm. since they announced mm-hmm. themselves in uh, January, and how they New Japan, like AEW's early success. Of course, I mean, it really is remarkable considering the fact that you know the. I mean, outside of, I mean, look, Cody Rhodes is someone that you know maybe has some mainstream awareness with. Uh, Western fans, mm-hmm. but the Young Bucks, I mean, of course, we know them. We're, you know, we're diehards. You know, yeah. We live in this world. The Kenny Omegas, you know, you know, but these aren't, or they weren't like, you know, mainstream guys. No. But yet and still, they were able to galvanize a fan base through the use of their of social media and their savvy marketing. Like, they're really good at that shit. And yeah. New Japan isn't. And... I think that's one other way where they can help themselves, uh, they being New Japan, to kind of help get and spread the word about their product is that I think they need to, they need to get better at their social media. Mm-hmm. And I think 
a lot of that means, you know, maybe, you know, hiring someone from outside to kind of uh, kind of spearhead that. Or maybe they got somebody inside. And I know Rocky Romero does a lot for that office. I mean, I don't know how good he is with social and kind of getting stuff out there, but I think that would help and go a long way. Um, because they're, they're, because there are, they're, they're a niche product in the States, but that niche, or niche, they have a niche fan base. Yeah. But that fan base is, is, is loyal and is big enough to at least sell out a mid-sized arena. Absolutely. So that's a, that, that's a good place to start. So it's like to grow that though, just, you know, I just get better with your, with your social, you know, kind of do some viral marketing kind of. You know, I mean, you don't have to spend a lot on this, but just get that word out. Yeah. Because I got to imagine the same people that are following AEW, Ring of Honor, like, of course, especially Ring of Honor, they got a working relationship with New Japan. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, it's like all these things kind of breed in the same circle. And I think New Japan just kind of really needs to be a little more proactive in, in creating that spatial and carving out spatial you know, that awareness here in the state versus... They kind of treat the states as almost like it's almost like they don't want to grow it. <laughs> like they say they do. But I mean, they, they got a dojo they do, here, though. I know. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, but they say they want to grow this thing, but they're they haven't done like their actions kind of are contrary to that edict. You know, like they haven't done anything to really uh, expand that awareness outside of just announcing they're running these shows. But it's like, well. Okay, but you know, got to do more than that. Yeah. You know, I, I think. I don't know. I think. I, go ahead. Oh, well, I think on 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 their end, I feel like they have to invest for their top stars or the stars that they know they want to invest in. Take them like, give them English classes. I think that's one thing that's really separating them from being not the top because you know it is what it is. But I mean, really expanding the brand. And showing off their top top stars. Their top stars can't speak English. And I think that's what's going to pigeonhole them in a certain spot until that changes. And I get it. You can't just have an American or a person outside of Japan as their top guy because they're based in Japan. I, I get that. And Kenny Omega was a great... was the. I would think Kenny Omega was the perfect example of someone who can bring New Japan to the masses. Because he could speak Japanese and English. Um, I feel like if they had Okada able to speak English, Tanahashi, um, I know um, Shibata could speak a little bit of English, uh, but I, I swear, if they really like said, okay, you know what we're going to do? Instead of you being on the road all the time, you're going to do special shows, but in between, you're taking English classes. We need to expand this brand. We need to let everybody know what's going on, who you are. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it's cool to get commentators who speak English and you're able to understand what's going on. But to the world and to the, the generic fan who might not know, they have to be able to understand who you are and what you're saying. And I think that's what's... Because me, I could watch a New Japan show and even not even have English commentary. Sometimes I feel like the Japanese commentary is better. And I don't even know what they're saying, and and, and I'm I'm just <laughs> watching it because it's they're excited. Like, but you understand some of the names of for the most well for me anyway, and it's just like I feel like maybe if they spoke English, it would help the brand more. Um, and that's and I think that's yeah. what they do in WWE. They tell Shinsuke Nakamura. I'm pretty sure they have Shinsuke Nakamura taking English classes. They did it to Alberto Del Rio, um, or that's what I heard. Um, I'm pretty sure they're doing that with Kushida. You know what I'm saying? Because they want them to be able to relate or, or be able to be understood by the fans. Oh. Yeah, you know, the, for me, like, you're probably right in terms of that. I mean, I'm sure that's probably the biggest barrier to a lot of fans is that they, is, is the language barrier. I would, I would like to think that that shouldn't have to be a, um, a roadblock to getting involved with, uh, with the Japan because I look at it, you know, this way. Yes, you know, these guys can can learn English. A lot of them do know some English because, like, you know, they teach it just as part of the regular curriculum in Japan. Yeah. And uh, and I've, I've heard Okada on uh, Cole Cabana's podcast. And his English is actually, I mean, good enough for him to <laughs> to be on that podcast and me not struggle or him not struggle to uh, get his point across. Yeah. 
Um, I just, I, I don't know. I think in 2019, and maybe this is just me talking, but it's like, I, the fact that someone doesn't speak English mm-hmm. shouldn't be a roadblock as far as them getting over with any crowd because, I mean, the UFC has had a lot of their fighters who uh, have not spoken English, and the easy way around that is to use a translator. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, and this is one thing where, where I know Vince McMahon, he's, he's, his whole thing is, you know, if the guys can't, you know, speak English, and like he doesn't know what to do with them. I mean, Asuka and Nakamura and all those guys. But uh, there's ways around that. I think that's just him being kind of hard-headed and just kind of stuck in his ways. Yeah. But, I don't know. I, like I said, you're probably right. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, that seems to be the most obvious thing. I mean, it is a, it's a, a foreign product, you know, from Japan, you know, no one's speaking English. Mm-hmm. But I just feel that even on, I, do you watch the show on uh, on Access? Which, which uh, New Japan? New Japan, yeah. Yeah, no, I watch New Japan, yeah. <laughs> no, no, the, the Access show. The one uh, that, that's on AXS? Uh, no, no, I don't I don't see that. Okay, all right. So so, 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 that's, so their television program here that they have on Access, I think... So for me, it's a post-produced show. Like, I think uh, today they're doing the, uh, the G1 Climax Final uh, on today's episode. So, so these shows are not live, obviously, but they're also not that long ago. They're usually maybe a week or two after the fact. Yeah. But I think I think that show could be a good, and honestly, I know that it is because the bar that I go to, uh, I have them. I put New Japan on <laughs> every Friday at five, and me and one, me and this friend of mine who goes to my, it's a local sports bar. Like he became a fan after he saw me watching it, and he was like what is this? And I was like, oh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's like, oh, man. He's like, this looks, like, is this, is this, uh, is this real? <laughs> or is this, you know, the, the scripted stuff like, like, like WWF? I'm like, no, it's still predetermined. And he was like, no 